If you were trapped in a deadly escape room that will kill you if it isn't solved in time, what would you do? These puzzles are nearly impossible to survive, and every second you waste brings you closer to death. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the death rooms in Escape Room 2. This woman is about to get herself killed. She plans to leave her husband tonight and enters his office to find him buried in his latest work. This man is the designer of the brutal escape rooms from the first movie, and he's working hard on his next masterpiece. She tells her husband she's leaving him, and he begs to talk about this later. The woman agrees to his request, with no idea that this was her biggest mistake. She decides to take a break in the sauna and clear her head, when suddenly three metal rods lock the door shut. The woman tries to force it open, but it won't budge. This room has turned into a deadly puzzle, and she begs her husband to let her out, but there's no response. That's when she finds a message on the glass door that reads, I grow in earth, I shrink in wind, I drown in water, I survive in fire. What am I? With time running out, she solves the riddle, realizing that there must be something hidden in the sauna's heater. Looking in the hot rocks, she finds one that looks different than the others and opens it up to discover a magnet hidden inside. With the temperature reaching fatal levels, she tries to slay the metal rods with the magnet and begins to unlock the door, but it's too late. The room is too hot to survive and she dies before she can escape. Okay, this woman was not using her brain. First of all, if your husband designs deadly escape rooms for a living, then you shouldn't break his heart and then go downstairs to relax in a steam room. If I were going to break up with a criminal mastermind, I would have left without telling him and hired a notary service to deliver him the divorce papers instead. She knew exactly what her husband did for a living and should have realized that this sauna is a death trap waiting to happen. In 2010, a Russian man died in the World Sauna Championship, tried to endure 230 degree heat for as long as possible. And if a hardcore Russian died within 6 minutes of exposure, I'd say this lady has only 3 minutes or less to escape. Now, the biggest mistake is to waste time on things that you know won't work, and that's exactly what this woman did. Her first instinct was to call her husband for help after asking for a divorce, which is a serious time waster. The most logical thing to do in this situation is to think about how to neutralize the threat first before considering how to get out. The source of danger is coming from the heater, and the only thing she has at her disposal is a towel, a shower head, and a pile of rocks. She can't stop the room from heating, but she can definitely limit its effects if she acts fast. The first thing I would do is use the towel to take out all the hot rocks, because if the water doesn't hit them, then steam won't be produced. The more water particles there are in a sauna, the more they will come into contact with you and transfer heat to your body. This can cause the skin and other bodily tissues to scald. Without steam, she'll be able to tolerate the heat and be able to breathe better to let her concentrate on escaping. From there, we could try using the rocks to crack the tempered glass. It's probably not going to produce enough force to shatter it, but not trying this would be far more stupid than trying and failing. I would also use a shower head to my advantage because we can use the cool water to bring down our core body temperature before we pass out from the heat. If she did any of this, not only would she have bought herself more time, but she also would have noticed that one of the rocks was different, revealing a magnet inside. The only other metallic objects are the rods, and at that point, the riddle on the door wouldn't even matter. Now lastly, there was one interesting detail that told us this has nothing to do with her husband. She might not be able to recognize the handwriting, but no self-respecting middle-aged man would make their periods into circles like they were Japanese schoolgirls. These ellipses here are a dead giveaway that her husband did not write this, and someone even more sadistic is behind it. Now there are four more escape rooms, and each one has hidden clues just like this that will tell us who designed them, and trust me, it's not who you think it is either. But what this mysterious death game designer doesn't realize is that there's actually a much better way for him to get his adrenaline fix. Mech Arena is a fast-paced mech shooter game that focuses on team PvP. And if you enjoy playing with your friends like me, this tactical 5 vs 5 shooter is the perfect balance of casual fun with skill-based competitive play, and none of your friends have to die in the process. I was honestly shocked by how well Mech Arena captured the magic of playing PC and console shooters with your friends. My personal favorite mechs and weapon combos are the Panther mech with a dual thermal lance shooting through stasis barriers like it's a meat shield, using the Lancer mech to leap and kill my enemies with a javelin rack, or rocking the dual RPGs on the kill shot mech and finishing people off with a melee dash when my ammo runs out. It's a ton of fun, and Mech Arena allows you to really express yourself with their awesome skins, including the ability to apply different paint jobs to your mechs and unlock different and unique personalized skins by using their Fortune Vault system. Mech Arena has awesome in-game events, as well as a great login rewards program, which you definitely don't want to miss out on. Use my link in the description or scan my QR code to get it for Android and iOS right now for free.
And as a bonus, you'll receive one black carbon skin, 300 A coins, and 50,000 credits to help start your game with a bang. So don't wait around. Add me to your friends list. My username is How to Beat, and join me for some matches. Thank you to Macarena for sponsoring this video. 18 years later, Zoe and Ben here are lucky to be alive. Both of them were tricked into playing a series of deadly escape rooms and were the only ones to make it out. This girl is determined to find out who the designer is so she can expose them and thinks she's discovered a clue. Using the escape room logo, she finds coordinates that lead to downtown Manhattan and together they decide to check it out. They get on the subway to follow the coordinates, but something doesn't feel right. There are only a handful of other passengers in this train car, and for rush hour in New York, that's really suspicious. Zoe here gets up to check out the conductor's booth, but is horrified to find no one inside. Suddenly, their car decouples from the rest of the train, and everyone starts to panic as they fall further behind. That's when the track shift rail lines, leading them down into an abandoned tunnel before it slams into the buffer stop. The boy tries to force the door open, but it won't budge, and now they're completely stuck with no way to escape. Desperate, this man presses the intercom and a message starts to play, telling them if they see a suspicious package, please find the nearest MTA employee. Nothing about this is normal, and Ben here tells Zoe that Minos, the escape room company, must have found them. Hearing this, the group is shocked, as everyone begins to realize that each person here has survived an escape room, and they've all just walked into their next death trap. That's when these Tesla coils pop out of the roof, as a high voltage current electrifies the train car, and touching anything metal will shock them. The bearded man Nate looks under his seat to find a hidden bag, but when he opens it up to look inside, a metal door handle falls out. Picking it off the ground, this man wraps his belt around the handle for installation and manages to open the train conductor's door. Looking inside, he finds a token slot and above it, Zoe notices a sign that reads, all false advertising must be pulled. It's their next clue. And Ben here knows exactly what to do next. Running back into the train car, he shows them that one of the adverts is missing the letter E, and the group splits up to search for more spelling mistakes. As the others find more clues, Zoe here counts the handholds in the car and realizes there are 26 of them. This could stand for each letter of the alphabet, and if they pull the handholds which represent the missing letters, they might get the subway tokens they need before they're all electrocuted. Okay, I'm officially impressed. I would be pissing my pants at the thought of being electrocuted to death while these guys have already figured out how to find the next clue. That's exactly why I would want to be in their group, because the smarter your team is, the better chances you have of escaping. These people have already survived an escape room before, and that means we can use their experiences to solve these puzzles as fast as possible. Now, first of all, this group wasted time by waiting for the game to tell them what they should be doing. They shouldn't need an announcement to tell them to look for any suspicious packages, because the first thing we should be doing in any escape room is to immediately identify what we can interact with. That way, when the game does give you a clue, you are faster to respond because you've already found the pieces to the puzzle. That's why I would immediately check the handles, look under the seats, pull the brake stop, and push every button. If any of them are rigged, we'll be able to engage the escape room much more quickly without having to waste valuable time. We should also be trying to come up with time-saving tactics to increase our chances of winning. The perfect example are these handles that represent the alphabet. If I have to find the letter O, it means I have to count 15 handles before I find the right one, and that's time we don't have to waste. If there are 9 letters we need to complete the puzzle, that could add up to a full minute just on counting letters of the alphabet. By simply placing an item of clothing on the handle for the letter L, we could cut that time in half. Because if the letter we're looking for comes after L, we would only need to count from there instead. When 30 seconds can make the difference between life and death, this is without a doubt the best way to be thinking. Lastly, I would make one lucky person do nothing except to watch the monitor here that fills the word as we find more tokens. Because if he can solve it before the word is filled, then we won't have to run around looking for missing letters on the advertisements, and that's going to be the biggest time saver of them all. It might be the most important job in the entire escape room, and these battle tested experts didn't even think about it. Checking the bag for more clues, they discover that the lining inside is made of rubber, and this woman uses her keys to cut it into pieces. Each player will need one to touch the metal handholds without being shocked, but as they're given out, the blonde woman notices that two of the handles are different colors. If the green one is the letter A, then the third one down will be the letter C. Taking a gamble, Zoe pulls it down and a token with that letter falls out. Their theory was correct, and Zoe puts it into the machine, telling her there are eight more tokens left. Following her lead, the group manages to find more tokens, but with every one they find, the electrical currents get stronger. It's the deadliest game of Hangman you've ever seen, as the players crawl along the floor, avoiding the electrical discharge. This guy looks up to find the final three letters they're missing, but before he can tell anybody what they are, a bolt of electricity knocks him into a metal pole, and the man starts frying to a crisp. 
taking a piece of rubber, the blonde woman tries to save him by knocking him to the floor, but the man's already dead. That's one player down and five more to go. With no time left to look for clues, Zoe reads the monitor and realizes it's spelling out the words welcome back. She tells the others they need to pull the handles for the letters W, B, and O, and they all work together to collect the last three. As Ben here inserts the final token into the coin slot, a trapdoor opens on the floor of the train, and the remaining survivors jump through to the other side. They've successfully escaped the puzzle, finding themselves inside an elevator that suddenly begins to descend. The lift finally comes to a stop, and the group takes a moment to introduce themselves. Zoe asks the others about the previous rooms they played in, and learns that each survivor was grouped with others who had the same occupations. Brianna here was with vloggers, and Nate here was in an escape room with other priests like him. But Ben feels that something is off. All of these players were allowed to go free, but when he won the game, someone tried to assassinate him, and Zoe here saved his life. The pattern doesn't make sense, but they'll soon find out that nothing is a coincidence. Okay. As much as I would love to hear about an escape room full of priests, having this discussion will not tell us how to stay alive. The group managed to escape by the skin of their teeth, but have already lost one of their most valuable players. This guy was clever enough to use his leather belt as insulation before anyone even realized that there was rubber inside of the bag. But they were caught off guard without a game strategy, and the time they wasted got this man killed. This is exactly why we need to take advantage of this elevator. Right now they have a rare moment in between two escape rooms where they aren't facing any danger at all. If it were me, I would stay here as long as it takes to come up with a plan for the next room because our lives depend on the other strangers in the group. And if any of them make stupid decisions or don't use their time wisely, it could get everyone killed. This elevator is the best chance we'll have to organize ourselves, assign roles, and establish positive chemistry so that everyone walks through this door with a specific agenda that benefits the whole group. Instead, they told each other sob stories about their past, and it was a total waste of everyone's time. Hearing a loud rumbling noise, the group rushed through the elevator doors to find themselves in a massive underground bank, and on the other side of the room is an open vault. Zoe here tests the locks on the front doors, but that's when a voice on the intercom announces that the security system has been armed. Without faking, Brianna here steps into the checkered floor, activating a field of deadly lasers that burn straight through the woman's skin. One wrong move and she's dead, but the others slowly guide her to move out of the laser's grid. They finally pull her to safety, and as soon as she steps off the checkered tile, the lasers immediately shut off. They all realize that this entire floor might be rigged, and that's when the voice announces they have 10 minutes until their only exit here closes with all lasers fully activated. The players start to look for another way across the tiles, but Nate here notices something strange in a bowl of lollipops, and picks one up to discover a key hidden inside. Taking the candy, Zoe here breaks it on the ground to remove the key, before climbing over the counter towards the deposit boxes. Ben here finds a special box that has the name Sonya on it, and realizes it must be their next clue. He tries the key, and it works, but when he opens it up, tons of small diamonds come pouring out. Zoe reaches down to pick one up, but immediately cuts her finger on it. These things are sharp enough to draw blood, but this can't be a coincidence. The players on the other side find a similar box, but theirs has two stacks of blank bills inside. That's when Nate sees an ATM nearby with a special message, telling them in order to get payment for the death of a loved one, he must enter a pin. Ben here figures out that the ATM's clue is a reference to blood money, and if they put Zoe's blood on the bills, they might find the pin number. The blonde woman is about to hand them over, but when she steps on the counter, the lasers suddenly turn back on. Losing her balance, she falls to the floor, but the lasers deactivate as soon as she steps off the counter. The woman survived, but they can't use the counters to solve the puzzle, and time is running out fast. Okay, this was really quick thinking from Ben here. He figured out that the diamonds and blank bills somehow added up to blood money, but this is actually a serious flaw in the game, because the only way to solve it is to cut your finger on the diamonds, and there's no guarantee that would even happen. If Zoe was more careful when she touched them, she wouldn't have cut her finger, and they might not have even considered that blood had anything to do with the clue at all. When solving the riddle requires a total coincidence like this, you know it's a flawed system, and they probably wouldn't have figured it out. Having said that, this room is more difficult than the last because it's much bigger. There are a lot more things to investigate and a larger area to search for them. When this group ran into the room, they were so distracted by the scale of the place that they missed these papers here and a bowl of lollipops. And noticing them could have saved as much as one out of their 10 minutes to escape. Despite this, there's always one instant clue they'll never need to look for, and that is the room itself. Each room has a theme, and the theme is already a hint that tells us what we should be searching for. In this case, it might include safes, keys, money, and pin numbers because they're all the things you would typically find in a bank. 
Now as for the floor tiles, this woman should have known better than to walk straight through the lobby like this. Every bank heist movie you've ever seen has lasers in it, and while this might seem obvious, there's actually a really important strategy here. When you see an empty floor like this, you should realize that the game's designers created the rooms by drawing from the same tropes and stereotypes that you are already familiar with, and this will help you anticipate where the dangers are coming from. Now, even though it's a terrible decision, she's actually done us a favor here, because now we can use this opportunity to study the laser pattern. If you look here, you'll see there might be enough room to crawl underneath them to reach the vault, but I would make sure somebody else tested this out for us because it's obviously a dangerous idea. This game must have cost millions of dollars to set up, so if there were any convenient loopholes like this, they were probably already discovered before we even set foot inside. Zoe wipes her blood on the blank bills, revealing the pin 0526. Nate here types in the four-digit code as the clocks on the wall suddenly begin to shift. It's their next clue, and he figures out that the times are actually a code to make it through the checkered floor safely. The hour represents a cardinal direction, and the minute is the number of steps they need to take. With only five minutes left, Nate volunteers to test their theory, leaving lollipops to mark down every safe tile. The plan is working, and he makes it halfway through when one of the tiles sinks to the floor, revealing a combination safe on the other side of the room. Suddenly, the tile he's standing on displays their next clue, reading, Money makes the world turn, don't let it stop, or else it all ends. The group desperately searches the bank records for a three-digit combination, but they're running out of time, and if they don't solve this puzzle, all of them will die. With no clues left to continue, Nate here decides to take a leap of faith and walks forward. The other players try to stop him, but he insists on letting God lead the way. That's when he steps on a tile that turns on the lasers, and he falls on the counter, knocking himself out. The women manage to pick him up and drag his feet off the tile to turn off the laser beams, but they still can't solve the clue. As the group begins to argue, Rihanna here suddenly realizes the riddle wants them to turn the lock without stopping. Running towards the safe, she twists it several times and the dial pops out revealing a secret container. Inside is a transparent graph and with only one minute remaining, the woman throws it to the other group for Zoe to place it over the floor plan, revealing the complete path through the checkered floor. She stays behind and reads out the instructions to the others who make their way to the vault door. With Ben carrying the priest to safety, they all make it to the exit and Zoe runs as fast as she can, slipping in through the door at the last second before the lasers can slice her into pieces. Okay, they all made it through to the next escape room, but it was definitely no thanks to this guy here. He decided to turn his brain off and trust God, knowing full well that he was putting everyone in danger. This is exactly why teamwork matters so much, because one person's bad thinking can get everyone killed. And if I were in this situation, I would have told him to sit in the corner and pray for our success. It's not going to help, but at least he's going to feel like he's contributing without risking our lives in the process. Now, to his credit, it was starting to look like they wouldn't be able to solve the puzzle in time. And when there are no options left, we have to take bigger risks to stay alive. If it were me, I would have looked for mirrors around the bank. Because if we could use them to deflect the lights, then we might be able to move across the laser grid without getting killed. Now, the most powerful lasers in the world can instantly vaporize any matter into a hot cloud of plasma. So as crazy as this looks, it's not science fiction. Even this guy managed to make a DIY super laser in his garage that could burn straight through metal. These things are scary, but using mirrors is a good strategy if things get desperate, and I'd be happy for this man to risk his life testing it out for us. Now, as for the actual puzzle, these guys are panicking too much to realize that the solution was extremely simple. They jumped to the wrong conclusion that they need a three-digit number to unlock the safe without trying the easiest solution first. The riddle said, don't let it stop or else it all ends. Logically speaking, looking for a three-digit code would be a complete contradiction of the riddle, because if you had numbers to open the lock with, you have to stop the dial on those numbers in order to input the code. So when the riddle says, don't let it stop, then looking for a combination is the worst conclusion you could draw here. On the other end of the vault door, the group finds themselves in a cave, and Ben here wakes Nate up, scolding him for almost getting Zoe killed. The girl tells them to calm down, and they all take a moment to catch their breaths. But the cave suddenly starts to collapse. The players all run out of the nearest exit before they're crushed to death and enter a beach-themed escape room with a lighthouse looming in the distance. But this one here wastes no time and has already found their first clue. Following the message on the Polaroid camera, she takes a picture and a blinding flash fills the room. When their eyes adjust, they notice the daylight has changed to sunset, and in the picture, they find a boat that's not in the ocean. The group thinks this is what they should be looking for, and starts searching through a pile of wreckage nearby. They find pieces of a metal detector inside and assemble it, before scanning the rest of the beach for their next clue. But that's when they pass two mannequins staged in a strange position. Zoe here thinks this must mean something, but suddenly the metal detector goes off, alerting them to a large metal object hidden below. Together, they dig into the sand and uncover an anchor that must have belonged to the boat in the picture. 
Ben tries to pull it out and realizes it's tied to something buried further down. But when the rest of the group helps him pull harder, the rope suddenly snaps. It gets sucked beneath the sand, and that's when they all notice that the beach floor is starting to bubble. It's turning into quicksand, and the blonde woman is standing right in the middle of it. They try to save her with a life buoy, but she's too far out of reach and gets pulled underground. The players are shocked, but Nate here decides to rescue her, tying a rope around his waist before diving headfirst beneath the surface. And that was the dumbest decision he could possibly make. The group desperately pulls on the rope, and Nate manages to lift the woman out of the sand as the others pull her to safety. But when they try to rescue the priest, the rope snaps, and the man is dragged straight into the afterlife. That's now two players down, and four more to go. Okay, this guy literally tied a lifesaver to himself and dove in when it would have made a lot more sense to just throw the lifesaver. This sand will swallow anything no matter how light it is, so a lifesaver would sink down and the girl would be able to grab on. Risking two team members' lives instead of one is just bad logic, and if I were in this situation, I wouldn't have let him take that risk because he's still a valuable asset to the group. The more people we have, the faster we can solve clues that help us all survive. And by trying to be a hero, he once again put everyone else in more danger. But what nobody was expecting is that this is not your average quicksand. For starters, it's bubbling, which means that there's a strong current of gas coming from below the surface. So it's much easier to fall into because it's not thick like what you would find in the jungle. This sand is what's called a fluidized bed, which can turn the ground you're walking on into a liquefied soup. If it's spreading, then the whole beach is going to be a danger zone soon. And if you want to save this girl in time, then we have to act quickly. I would use this board here because it might be long enough to lay across the pit, so that each side is sitting on stable ground. Then, we can have someone crawl halfway across and reach their hand in to try and pull her out. Now there's one situation where diving in might actually be the right decision. If we eventually find ourselves completely surrounded by the quicksand with nowhere to turn, the one benefit here is that this fluidized sand bed creates a frictionless surface. So even though we can sink down into it, we might also be able to surf across it just as easily. Science says that the frictionless sand will carry you across to the other side, and there's just enough logic in that argument to convince someone to test the theory. If they survive, then we'll know it's a safe method we can use to cross it safely as well. With the quicksand spreading across the beach, the group has no choice but to grab the anchor and run towards the shack, leaving their teammate behind. That's when they find an imprint in the door here, and Brianna places the anchor into the groove. Unlocking it, the players run inside to safety, and Zoe here finds a photo in the kitchen that says, Bon Voyage. She realizes that this refrigerator might be their way out of here, but they need to find the head for this unplugged power cord if they want to escape. The group searches the building for a connector, but Zoe notices a hidden light switch here and decides to flick it on. That's when the whole room starts to shake, and the light outside suddenly turns to night. Looking out the window, Zoe here sees the lighthouse has turned on, and a ladder has popped out of the side. There must be a clue up there, and she runs to check it out while the others stay behind to look for the missing cable head. Climbing up the lighthouse, she reaches the top and peers through the telescope to find their next clue. It's a message in a bottle that reads, I can't see you, and she tells the others what she's found. Zoe's about to climb down from the lighthouse to join the group, when she notices something strange about the moon's frame on the wall. Meanwhile, Ben here has already figured out the clue. He remembers the mannequin from earlier with shells on her eyes, and realizes I can't see you is telling him exactly where to look. Ben runs over to find the mannequin sinking into the sand, and removes one of the shells to find the cable head that they've been looking for. He brings it back to the others, and they use it to plug the fridge back in, letting them finally open the door to the next room. But things are about to go horribly wrong. Zoe has taken off the moon's frame to discover a hidden exit, and she thinks it might lead them out of the game. She tells the others about the escape route, but Brianna here doesn't want to leave. Ben tries to convince her to join them, but there's no more time to argue, and they head for the lighthouse, leaving her behind. The blonde woman makes it up the ladder just in time, but Ben isn't so lucky. As he's climbing towards them, the handholds start retracting, and just as he reaches the top, the boy loses his grip. Zoe can only watch in horror as he falls into the quicksand, making that three players down with three more to go. Okay, this is the first time we've seen two solutions to the same escape room, and there's no way we could have expected this to happen. That's why it's actually a terrible idea for Zoe here to be investigating this move. When you're minutes away from death, and you already know where the exit is, you wouldn't want to spend the last moments of your life breaking off a set prop based on just a random hunch. She got very lucky that this actually led somewhere, because otherwise she would have been dead, and all the others would have escaped through the fridge without her. Now, as for the others in the shack, they weren't using their time wisely either. Instead of racing around the room looking for a clue they can't even solve, I would have used my time doing everything I could to open that fridge. 
I mean, look at this thing. There's nothing here that says they wouldn't have been able to force the door open if they hadn't tried, but they got too stressed out to focus their energy into something more constructive. It's the exact same thing that happened in the bank with the combination lock, because they turned their brains off to search for another pin number instead of investigating the door they needed to open. They need to get better at responding to each new environment before it gets the better of them, and the best way to do that is to consider how the place has been designed as soon as they enter the room. If you take a step back and look at the environment here, you'll realize the escape room designer has her thumbprint on everything in the game, and by paying attention to the patterns that emerge, we might be able to predict the designer's decisions and advance to the room much faster without wasting valuable time. First of all, we know that somewhere on this beach is a door to the next room, and that door needs to be placed somewhere structurally sound. This makes it most likely to be against the wall or attached to a sturdy building. So instead of having the whole group walk along the beach together, they should have sent somebody off to find the exit while the others look for clues. They also should have realized that the game designer will somehow use the sand as a threat to push them further into the escape room, because running from danger will always lead them to their next clue. It's exactly like the bank floor in the last room, because the laser grid encouraged them to explore the sides behind the counter. Thinking like this is one of the best ways to hack the game without cheating, because we can easily identify false clues, which items to interact with, and the natural path of each room as we progress through it instead of wasting that time playing tic-tac-toe. Zoe is frozen in shock, but the blonde one pulls her through the exit and into the tunnel. They're lucky to be alive, but Zoe here is too traumatized by her friend's death to continue. Trying to comfort her, the blonde reveals that she can't feel physical pain, and in the previous escape room, she had to face sadistic puzzles built specifically to torture her. They need to stop the mastermind before more people suffer, and it gives Zoe here the will to continue. Together, the two players explore the room when they suddenly hear the sound of traffic above them. Finding a ladder, they climb it and discover it leads them back to the streets of Manhattan. They finally escape the game, but that's when Brianna here comes running out, telling them to keep the manhole open. Suddenly, a cover pops into place, closing off their exit and the background starts to glitch out. Zoe here realizes they're inside another escape room, and this one is the most brutal of them all. Brianna here warns them that for this puzzle, it's going to start raining acid as soon as the timer hits zero, and she thinks that this door is their way out, but the doors are locked. The group notices graffiti of an angel holding a key, and a message that says, I'll always be watching over you, May 26. Looking above the shop, the players realize there's a cloud-shaped sign hanging over the building, and the missing key must be on the rooftop. Climbing up the ladder, Brianna here goes to search for it and discovers the key is attached to the railing here. With 30 seconds left, she throws the key down to the blonde, who quickly uses it to open the padlock. Working together, the group find lifts the shutters open, but they're all horrified to find another locked door behind it. The timer reaches zero, and just before the rain comes down, an awning pops out to protect them. They barely escaped a painful death, but when the countdown resets, there are 30 seconds less than before. Suddenly, a phone starts ringing across the street, and they notice a metal chain holding the phone booth shut, but Zoe here realizes they can melt it off. The blonde goes searching for a container to collect the acid and finds his ketchup bottle on a food cart. Looking on the bottom, she discovers that it's acid proof and the woman leaves it on the street to run for cover just seconds before it starts to rain again. Their plan is working, and as the timer resets to 45 seconds, they grab the bottle and rush to the phone booth, dumping the acid over the chains as the metal breaks off. But when Zoe runs inside to pick up the phone, nobody answers on the other end. That's when she spots a taxi ad that says, when the weather turns, give us a call, and she realizes that the nearby cab must be their next clue. She runs out of the booth to take a look, but they're already out of time. Luckily, the blonde woman finds an umbrella, tossing it for Zoe to catch, and she opens it up at the last second, just barely surviving the acid rain. Suddenly, she spots an advert on a nearby pawn shop that says three rings, and tells them they need to let the phone ring three times before answering. Following her instructions, the blonde woman waits before picking up the phone, and as soon as she does, the taxi's door swings open. Zoe quickly hops into the car, and the rain stops pouring, but as the other players run for the cab to join her, the door locks itself shut before they reach it. Turning around, they notice the phone booth closes too, and Zoe can only watch as the others dissolve in the rain. That makes five players down, and only one left. Okay, this was tragic, but these girls gave up way too easily, because there was at least one more way they could have stayed alive. With less than 15 seconds left, they were still pulling on the door handle until time ran out, and they finally gave up. Not once did they stop to consider that they could have just crawled underneath the taxi to wait out the rain. This is a Ford Crown Victoria, which is the iconic make of a New York taxi cab, and if you look at the official dimensions of these cars, you'll see that they sit about 13 and a half inches off the ground, which is more than enough to squeeze your body underneath it. 
Now, I understand that when you're in an escape room with seconds to live, panic takes over and limits your ability for critical thinking. But our survival instincts are not as dumb as you might think. When your only way to survive is to get out of the rain, and crawling under the car is literally the only way you can do it, even someone in a total state of panic should have figured this out. Once the rain stops, they could have crawled back out and taken the chain from the phone booth to try and break the window of the taxi. Banging on it with your hands and feet is not going to do the job, because these windows are made of tempered glass, and they're only designed to break if the force is applied to a very small point. That's why a typical glass breaker looks like this, because it concentrates all of your strength into this metal tip, which makes the glass shatter into small pieces. The chains here could help them do this, and they'd be able to try as many times as they like, because if it starts raining again, they can just crawl back under the cab. Now, there's one strategy that could have completely changed the outcome of this game, and it all comes down to this blonde woman. Earlier, she confessed to Zoe that she has a hereditary disease that prevents her from feeling pain. This is actually a rare medical condition called SEPA syndrome, and that really pisses me off. If I knew I couldn't feel pain, then I would have volunteered to be the one outside of the phone booth looking for clues. She's the obvious choice to be exposing herself to danger, and staying inside this phone booth was her biggest mistake. Because if she had volunteered to use her disease to help the group, then she would have been the one who jumped in the cab, and that one decision could have ultimately saved her life. All of a sudden, the car seat opens and she falls through the chute. Later, Zoe slowly wakes up in another room to find a teenage girl staring at her from behind a glass cage. That's when Zoe notices a box full of items and remembers all of them were clues in the escape rooms. She realizes all these puzzles were about Claire here and the girl confesses that Sonya was the name of her mom who died on May 26th. Claire is the daughter of the escape room designer and he's been keeping the girl hostage ever since her mother died. Zoe then notices blueprints for the train puzzle in the background and figures out this girl designed all the escape rooms herself. Claire tries to calm the girl down, explaining that she was forced to make these puzzles and that the girl's friend is still alive. Zoe doesn't trust what she's hearing, so Claire shows her a live video feed of Ben inside of a cell, but everything is about to change. The girls watch as guards storm into the room and the boy is taken out to play one final game. They throw him into the same sauna that the woman died in at the beginning of the movie, and that's where he finds a combination lock that needs four numbers to open. Looking around, he notices an empty frame and grabs a stone to fit inside the slot, but the boy has no idea that this last escape room is rigged for failure. Zoe yells at the daughter to save her friend, but the girl explains she can only help if they break into her father's study to stop the escape room and will need to first be let out of her glass cage. With Ben in danger, Zoe manages to open the glass door. The girl reunites with her friend on the other side, but he suddenly drops to the floor and her father comes out of hiding with a loaded gun pointed straight at her head. He shoves his daughter against the wall, furious that she would want to leave him, but never sees the injured man pull out his gun, shooting him in the arm. Falling back, his daughter pushes him into the glass cage and locks the man inside. With the father dealt with, the girls leave the men behind, making their way to the study and Claire runs straight for the computer to shut down the escape room, saving Ben from being boiled alive in the sauna. Zoe asks where her friend is, and Claire tells her he's at an abandoned warehouse in Manhattan before throwing the keys to her father's car to help the girl escape. Claire promises to have the police arrest her father for everything he's done to them, and Zoe can tell something doesn't add up. But she decides to drive away, leaving the mansion to look for her friend. Later, she arrives at the warehouse where the cops have set up a crime scene, and finds Ben being wheeled into an ambulance. He's still alive. And with the puzzle maker locked in a glass cage, she's relieved that the only thing they'll have to be escaping now are Ben's medical bills. Back at the mansion, Claire goes back to confront her father and admits to him that she wanted to create the escape rooms to get his attention. She also created the first sauna escape room to murder her own mother, hoping to use the tragedy to get closer to her father. Now that the man is locked in a prison of his own making, she can replace him as the new mastermind puzzle maker, and this girl is ready to take daddy issues to a whole new level. But what do you think? How would you beat Escape Room 2? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.